Embark on a captivating historical adventure as we follow Samuel Baker and Florence von Sass on their daring expedition to uncover the source of the Nile River. This captivating series delves deep into the challenges and triumphs of their 19th century African odyssey. Witness the harsh realities of desert travel, navigate the treacherous Nile cataracts, and encounter diverse tribes along the way. A Journal of the Nile, Samuel Baker's Quest for the Source. Dreams of a White Nile, London, England, March 1, 1863. A crisp March wind whipped through the bustling streets of London, carrying with it the scent of coal smoke and damp cobblestones. Inside his modest study, Samuel White Baker hunched over a worn map of Africa, its edges frayed from countless examinations. A calloused finger traced the meandering blue line of the Nile River, its source shrouded in mystery for millennia. For years, Baker, a seasoned explorer with a thirst for adventure, had been captivated by the enigma of the Nile. Explorers before him had ventured deep into Africa, each returning with tantalizing glimpses, but no definitive answer. Where did the mighty river, the lifeblood of Egypt, begin? The vast expanse of white on the map, representing uncharted territory, fueled Baker's determination. He wouldn't be another who returned empty-handed. The idea for the expedition had sprouted from conversations with John Hanning Speak, a fellow explorer who claimed to have discovered the source of the Nile, Lake Victoria. However, Speak's evidence was disputed, igniting a fierce geographical debate. Baker, himself an experienced traveler in Africa, believed there was more to the story. The Nile had to have another source, further south, deeper in the heart of the continent. Driven by a mix of scientific curiosity and a desire to settle the debate, Baker began meticulous preparations. He meticulously researched past expeditions, studying their successes and failures. He procured sturdy boats suitable for navigating the treacherous Nile rapids, along with essential supplies, tents, quinine to combat malaria, trade goods for barter with local tribes, and an arsenal of weapons for self-defense. More importantly, he sought a companion for this arduous journey. He found her in Florence von Sass, a Hungarian woman of remarkable spirit and resilience. Despite societal disapproval of a woman embarking on such a dangerous expedition, Florence, an accomplished hunter and markswoman, proved to be an invaluable asset. Together, they formed a formidable team, united by a shared love of adventure and a burning desire to unlock the secrets of the Nile. The days leading to their departure were a whirlwind of activity. Packing, recruiting experienced porters, obtaining last-minute supplies, every detail was meticulously considered. As the date of departure drew closer, a nervous excitement crackled in the air. This wasn't just an expedition, it was a quest for knowledge, a journey into the unknown that could rewrite the map of Africa. A steamy farewell, London, England, Alexandria, Egypt, March 15, 1863. The biting London wind had been replaced by a humid caress as the steamship, Ripon, sliced through the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean. Two weeks had passed since their departure from England, and already a sense of adventure thrummed through the air. Samuel Baker stood at the ship's railing, Florence by his side, their gazes fixed on the distant horizon. The sprawling metropolis of London had shrunk to a hazy memory, replaced by the promise of a new and uncharted future. Their journey began with a bumpy train ride across France to Marseille, where they boarded the Ripon. The ship, crammed with passengers and cargo, offered a microcosm of the world. Merchants from India, French officials heading to colonial outposts, wide-eyed tourists embarking on Mediterranean cruises. Florence, ever the social butterfly, navigated these diverse social circles with ease, while Samuel spent his days poring over maps and travel journals, gleaning every last bit of information about the Nile and the formidable terrain that lay ahead. The voyage to Alexandria, the bustling port city at the mouth of the Nile, was a revelation. The deep blue of the Mediterranean gave way to the muddy brown of the Nile Delta, a vast network of waterways teeming with life. Boats of all shapes and sizes bobbed on the water, feluccas with billowing white sails, sturdy barges laden with cargo, and small fishing skiffs manned by weathered fishermen. 
The air itself buzzed with the cacophony of calls in Arabic, the rhythmic clanging of metal on metal as workers repaired a dock, and the raucous cries of seagulls diving for scraps. Alexandria itself was a sensory overload. A chaotic blend of ancient and modern, the city boasted towering mosques with soaring minarets, bustling souks overflowing with spices and textiles, and remnants of its pharaonic past nestled amidst the urban sprawl. Baker and Florence spent their days exploring the city, haggling with merchants for supplies, quinine, mosquito nets, and sturdy boots, and hiring a team of experienced dragomans, interpreters, and porters to accompany them on their journey up the Nile. The farewell dinner on board the Ripon was a bittersweet affair. There were toasts to adventure and whispered anxieties about the unknown that awaited them. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an orange glow across the churning water, the anchor was weighed, and the Ripon steered towards the murky mouth of the Nile. The real journey, the one that would test their courage and resourcefulness, was about to begin. They were leaving behind the familiar world and venturing into the heart of Africa, propelled by a yearning for discovery and a burning desire to unravel the mysteries of the Nile. Trials of the Nile, Alexandria, Egypt, Wadi Halfa, Sudan, April 1, 1863. The first month on the Nile was a baptism by fire. Gone were the luxurious cabins of the Ripon. Their new home was a Dahabia, a traditional Egyptian sailboat with a single cabin and a large deck. The relentless sun beat down mercilessly, turning the air thick and humid. Mosquitoes, relentless and hungry, descended upon them at dusk, their buzzing a constant torment. The food, a monotonous diet of unleavened bread and fowl, stewed fava beans, left them yearning for the varied meals they had enjoyed aboard the steamer. Yet, Amidst the physical discomfort, a sense of wonder bloomed. The Nile unfolded before them like a majestic ribbon, its banks adorned with lush date palm groves and quaint mudbrick villages. Herds of water buffalo grazed lazily along the water's edge, their snorts echoing across the stillness. Fishermen cast their nets in the shallows, their rhythmic movements a testament to a way of life unchanged for centuries. The most significant challenge, however, wasn't the harsh climate, but navigating the treacherous Nile cataracts. These series of rapids, where the river plunged over rocky outcrops, posed a constant threat to their vessel. Here, the tranquility of the Nile vanished, replaced by the churning fury of white water. Baker, ever the resourceful leader, orchestrated a ballet of skilled sailors and strong-armed porters. They maneuvered the Dahabia with ropes and poles, their shouts and commands echoing through the canyon walls. Each successfully navigated rapid was a victory, a testament to their teamwork and unwavering spirit. As they ventured further south, the landscape began to change. The fertile Nile Valley gave way to a harsh desert, the sand shimmering under the relentless sun. The air grew dry and dusty, making even the simplest tasks a chore. They encountered nomadic tribes, the Bisharin, with their distinctive facial scarification and colorful clothing, who, despite their initial suspicion, offered them trade and safe passage. One evening, as they camped under a sky ablaze with stars, Florence pointed towards a distant flickering light. Following it, they stumbled upon a small trading outpost, a haven of camaraderie amidst the vast desert. Here, they bartered for supplies and exchanged stories with seasoned travelers, European explorers, Arab merchants, and even a group of slavers, their presence a stark reminder of the darker side of this land. By the time they reached Wadi Halfa, a small town perched on the edge of the desert, they had traveled nearly 1,000 miles. They were exhausted, sunburnt, and plagued by a constant barrage of mosquito bites. Yet, their spirits remained high. They had conquered the first leg of their journey, navigating the treacherous Nile and adapting to the harsh realities of life in Africa. Wadi Halfa served as a crucial waypoint, a place to restock supplies, hire additional porters familiar with the challenging terrain ahead, and prepare for the next phase of their expedition, venturing deeper into the uncharted heart of Africa, in relentless pursuit of the elusive source of the Nile. Into the uncharted, Wadi Halfa, Sudan, 
Sobat River Junction, South Sudan, May 1, 1863. Wadi Halfa was a bustling crossroads, a place where the languid pace of the Nile Valley collided with the harsh realities of the desert. Here, Baker and Florence spent a fortnight replenishing their supplies and assembling their team for the next leg of their journey. Gone were the graceful dahabias. Their new mode of transport would be a ragtag collection of camels, sturdy and sure-footed beasts essential for navigating the unforgiving terrain that lay ahead. Their new crew reflected the diverse tapestry of the region. They recruited experienced guides from local tribes, men with a deep understanding of the desert and its unforgiving ways. These guides, adorned with intricate tribal markings and wrapped in flowing robes, spoke a language of gestures and expressions, a silent communication honed through generations of navigating the vast emptiness. There were also porters, men and women from nearby villages, their faces etched with hardship, but their eyes gleaming with a spark of adventure. Leaving the relative comfort of Wadi Halfa behind, they plunged into the heart of the Nubian desert. The landscape transformed into a sea of golden sand dunes, sculpted by the relentless wind into ever-shifting shapes. The relentless sun beat down mercilessly, turning the midday hours into a punishing test of endurance. Mirages shimmered on the horizon, taunting them with visions of cool, refreshing water. Even the nights offered little respite, the temperature remained stubbornly high, and the sky, ablaze with a million stars, offered only a cold, impersonal beauty. Water became their most precious commodity. They rationed it meticulously, using it sparingly for drinking, cooking, and basic hygiene. The camels, their only means of transportation, were equally frugal, surviving on the sparse desert vegetation and the occasional drink from hidden waterholes known only to their skilled guides. The days blurred into a monotonous routine, the slow, plodding gait of the camels, the relentless sun, the ever-present thirst. Yet, amidst the hardship, a sense of wonder bloomed. They encountered majestic oryx antelopes with their spiraling horns, graceful sand grouse darting through the dunes, and the haunting calls of hyenas echoing through the night. The raw beauty of the desert, its starkness and unforgiving nature, filled them with a profound respect for the resilience of life in this harsh environment. Finally, after weeks of relentless travel, they reached the confluence of the White Nile and the Blue Nile, the two main tributaries that fed the mighty river. This point, marked by a vast floodplain where the two rivers merged, held immense significance. It was a pivotal moment in their journey, a place where the Nile's character shifted yet again. Here, they would abandon the familiar sand dunes and embark on a new challenge, navigating the lush, green labyrinth of the equatorial region, venturing deeper into the uncharted territories in their relentless pursuit of the Nile source. River of Reeds, Sobat River Junction, South Sudan, Latuka Country, South Sudan, June 1, 1863. Leaving the sandy embrace of the Nubian Desert behind, Baker and Florence found themselves in a new world. The confluence of the White and Blue Niles marked a dramatic shift in the landscape. Gone were the endless dunes. Instead, a vast green carpet stretched before them, the beginning of the sud, a sprawling marshland teeming with life. The air, thick with humidity, carried the cacophony of unseen creatures, the chirping of insects, the raucous calls of birds, and the occasional trumpeting of a hippopotamus hidden amongst the reeds. Their mode of transport changed once again. Camels, designed for the harsh desert environment, were ill-suited for the swampy terrain. Instead, they relied on dugout canoes, narrow and unstable vessels propelled by skilled paddlers from local tribes. These men, their bodies adorned with intricate scarification and their faces etched with the challenges of life in this unforgiving environment, navigated the labyrinthine waterways with practiced ease. The sud was a paradise for flora and fauna. Giant papyrus reeds, towering over 20 feet high, formed a dense green maze that choked the waterways. Papyrus flowers, delicate and white, bloomed amidst the reeds, offering a fleeting beauty to this harsh landscape. On the muddy banks, crocodiles basked in the sun, their reptilian eyes tracking every movement 
and troops of baboons with their guttural calls swung from the branches of overhanging trees. However, the beauty of the sud came with a price. Mosquitoes, relentless and bloodthirsty, descended upon them in swarms, leaving behind itchy welts and the constant threat of malaria. Navigation was a constant struggle. The labyrinthine waterways, choked with reeds and hidden dangers, demanded constant vigilance. Food supplies dwindled as they struggled to find game in this watery wilderness. The oppressive humidity sapped their energy, leaving them exhausted and longing for a breath of cool, dry air. Despite the challenges, Florence proved to be an invaluable asset. A skilled markswoman, she supplemented their dwindling food supplies with her hunting prowess. Her keen eye for detail and meticulous note-taking documented the unique flora and fauna they encountered. More importantly, her unwavering spirit and optimism bolstered the morale of the entire expedition. One evening, as they camped on a small, elevated island, they were approached by a group of Latuka, a local tribe known for their fierce reputation. Fear coursed through the camp, but Florence, ever the diplomat, stepped forward, offering gifts and gestures of peace. The Latuka, impressed by her courage and respectful demeanor, entered into a cautious trade agreement, providing them with much-needed food and a renewed sense of hope. Their journey through the Sud was a slow and arduous process, a constant battle against the elements and the unforgiving terrain. Yet, with each passing day, they felt themselves getting closer. They were pushing into uncharted territory, the first Europeans to navigate these treacherous waterways. The rumors they had gathered from local tribes, tales of a vast lake, the source of the White Nile, fueled their determination. They were on the cusp of a discovery that could rewrite the map of Africa, and the hardships they endured only strengthened their resolve. Whispers on the wind, Latuka country, South Sudan, Pachodo, Ottoman Empire, July 1st, 1863. The Sud, with its relentless maze of reeds and oppressive humidity, had tested them to their limits. But as July dawned, they finally emerged from the watery labyrinth, blinking in the sunlight as they entered a new landscape. Rolling hills, dotted with patches of verdant savanna, stretched before them. The air, though still warm, carried a refreshing breeze, a welcome change from the stifling atmosphere of the swamps. News of their arrival spread quickly through the region. They were met by wary but curious representatives from local tribes, the Bari, with their distinctive facial tattoos, and the Madi, known for their skilled craftsmanship. Through a combination of sign language, gifts, and the help of their ever-reliable Latuka guides, Baker and Florence were able to establish a fragile peace. These encounters provided them with invaluable information, tales of a vast lake, a legendary source of the White Nile, hidden deep within the mountains to the south. The journey that followed was a grueling trek through rugged terrain. They traded their canoes for sturdy donkeys, their sure-footedness essential for navigating the uneven paths. The days were scorching hot, the sun a relentless tormentor. At night, the air grew cool, and the sky, ablaze with stars, offered a breathtaking spectacle. The constant threat of wild animals, lions roaring in the distance, the menacing glow of hyena eyes reflecting in the moonlight, added an edge of danger to their journey. Despite the challenges, their spirits remained high. The whispers of a great lake grew louder with each passing day. Local tribes confirmed their suspicions, pointing towards the southern horizon and speaking of a vast body of water, the birthplace of the mighty Nile. Their excitement was palpable. They were on the verge of a historic discovery, the culmination of months of hardship and relentless pursuit. Finally, after weeks of arduous travel, they reached the crest of a hill. Gasping for breath, not from exertion but from sheer awe, they gazed upon a sight that would forever etch itself into their memory. Spread out before them, shimmering like a jewel under the midday sun, lay a vast expanse of water, Lake Albert as it would later be named. This massive lake, a source of the White Nile, was a revelation, the answer to a geographical mystery that had captivated explorers for centuries. Standing on that hilltop, sweat dripping from their brows and exhaustion etched on their faces, 
Baker and Florence shared a moment of quiet triumph. They had achieved the seemingly impossible, venturing into the heart of Africa and uncovering the source of the Nile. They had faced down physical hardships, navigated treacherous landscapes, and forged relationships with local tribes. Their journey, far from over, had already secured their place in history as pioneers, forever linked to the secrets of the mighty Nile. Echoes of Triumph, Shadows of Peril, Pachoto, Ottoman Empire, August 1st, 1863. The elation of their discovery at Lake Albert was quickly tempered by the harsh realities of their situation. Exhausted and running low on supplies, they knew they couldn't linger by the lake for long. Their initial goal, reaching the source of the Nile, had been achieved, but their journey was far from over. They had to return to civilization, document their findings, and share their groundbreaking discovery with the world. Their path back north was fraught with new challenges. News of their exploration hadn't reached all corners of the region. They encountered hostile tribes who viewed them with suspicion, forcing them to rely on their diplomatic skills and Florence's sharpshooting to navigate tense situations. Food shortages became a constant worry, and the ever-present threat of malaria continued to plague them. Finally, after weeks of arduous travel, they reached Pachoto, a small Ottoman outpost on the White Nile. This dusty town, a frontier settlement teeming with traders and soldiers, offered a sense of relief and a much-needed respite. The sight of European faces, albeit few and far between, was a welcome change after months spent traversing uncharted territory. News of their arrival at Pachoto spread like wildfire. The Ottoman governor, impressed by their tale and the sheer scale of their accomplishment, received them with open arms. He offered them food, shelter, and most importantly, a moment of peace to recuperate and document their experiences. Over the next few weeks, Baker meticulously documented their journey. He sketched detailed maps of the Nile's course, noting landmarks, villages, and the various tribes they encountered. Florence, with her keen eye for detail, filled notebooks with descriptions of the flora and fauna, the customs of the local people, and the breathtaking landscapes they witnessed. However, their stay in Pachoto wasn't all rest and recovery. Rumors swirled of a growing threat, a rebellion brewing against the Ottoman rule. The governor, already stretched thin in maintaining order, became increasingly wary of the potential for violence. He urged Baker and Florence to leave Pachoto as soon as possible, fearing their safety caught in the crossfire. With a heavy heart, they prepared for their departure. They had achieved their primary goal, but their time in Pachoto served as a stark reminder of the political realities and ongoing conflicts that plagued the region. As they embarked on the next leg of their journey, they carried with them not only the elation of discovery, but also the knowledge that their adventure was far from over. The challenges of navigating political turmoil and returning safely to Europe awaited them, adding a new layer of uncertainty to their extraordinary expedition. Escape under a blood moon, Pachoto, Ottoman Empire, Gondokaro, Ottoman Egypt, September 1, 1863. The air crackled with tension as Baker and Florence departed Pachoto. The once bustling town now seemed cloaked in a shroud of paranoia. Whispers of rebellion grew louder with each passing day, and the Ottoman governor's forced hospitality had a whiff of desperation. Heeding his warnings, they set sail down the White Nile on a sturdy riverboat, their hearts heavy with the knowledge that their journey home had just become considerably more complicated. The once majestic Nile now felt like a treacherous path. Patrols from both rebel and Ottoman forces scanned the riverbanks, their intentions unclear. Days turned into weeks, each sunset painting the sky a fiery orange, a color that seemed to mirror the growing unrest. They encountered abandoned villages, their inhabitants fled in fear of the coming conflict. The once boisterous sounds of river life were replaced by an unsettling silence, broken only by the rhythmic churn of the boat's paddle wheel. One moonlit night, the silence shattered. Drums pounded a relentless rhythm from the distant shore, a chilling war cry echoing across the water. The rebels had attacked a nearby Ottoman outpost. Panic erupted on their boat. Soldiers scrambled to defend the vessel, gunfire erupting in the stillness. 
Florence, ever resourceful, directed the crew to steer towards a hidden inlet, a maneuver that just barely saved them from the hail of bullets. Huddled together beneath the watchful eye of a blood-red moon, they realized their precarious position. Caught in the crossfire, Pachoto was no longer an option. They needed to reach Gondokaro, a larger Ottoman settlement further north, where they hoped to find refuge and a means of escape from this escalating conflict. The journey to Gondokoro was a desperate scramble. They traveled at night, relying on the stars and Florence's exceptional sense of direction. They bartered with wary villagers for food, their dwindling supplies a constant source of anxiety. The constant threat of violence gnawed at their nerves, transforming their return trip into a desperate fight for survival. Finally, after weeks of hardship and barely escaping another skirmish, they arrived at Gondokaro. This bustling town, a major trading center on the Nile, offered a semblance of order amidst the chaos. The Ottoman governor, surprised but relieved by their arrival, offered them sanctuary. Exhausted and shaken, Baker and Florence had finally reached a safe haven, but their ordeal was far from over. The rebellion continued to rage, and their journey back to Europe remained shrouded in uncertainty. Gondokoro, though a temporary respite, would become the base for their next challenge, securing passage home and ensuring the world knew of their groundbreaking discovery, the source of the Nile, Lake Albert. Whispers across continents, Gondokoro, Ottoman Egypt, London, England, March 1, 1864. Gondokoro, a bustling hub of trade and intrigue, offered a stark contrast to the harsh realities they had just endured. Here, amidst the cacophony of languages and the vibrant displays of exotic goods, Baker and Florence found a temporary haven. The Ottoman governor, impressed by their tale and recognizing the potential significance of their discovery, provided them with a small but comfortable residence and access to fresh supplies. However, Gondokoro wasn't without its challenges. News of the rebellion continued to trickle in, a constant reminder of the precariousness of their situation. Communication with Europe remained a frustratingly slow process, reliant on unreliable postal routes and the whims of passing traders. The weight of their accomplishment, the groundbreaking discovery of Lake Albert, hung heavy in the air, a story yearning to be shared with the world. Baker, ever the resourceful leader, wasted no time. He spent his days meticulously compiling his journals, his detailed descriptions, and hand-drawn maps bringing their journey to life. Florence, with her sharp observations and keen artistic talent, added her own unique perspective through detailed sketches of the landscapes, people, and wildlife they encountered. Together, they were piecing together a narrative that had the potential to rewrite geographical knowledge and capture the public imagination. Their opportunity arrived in the form of a small trading expedition heading to Cairo. Negotiations were tense, but Baker's determination and the promise of a compelling story eventually secured them passage. The journey north was arduous, weeks spent enduring the scorching desert heat and the monotonous rhythm of camel caravans. Yet, with each passing day, they inched closer to civilization and the chance to share their momentous discovery. Finally, in March 1864, after nearly a year in Africa, they arrived in Cairo. News of their arrival spread like wildfire. Explorers, geographers, and journalists clamored to hear their story. Baker, a natural raconteur, captivated audiences with his descriptions of the treacherous journey, the hostile tribes, and finally, the awe-inspiring sight of Lake Albert. Florence's detailed sketches and meticulous notes added authenticity and depth to their narrative. The media frenzy was a whirlwind. Their story dominated headlines across Europe and America. They were hailed as heroes, pioneers who had unraveled the ancient mystery of the Nile source. Geographical societies bestowed them with honors, and public lectures packed to the rafters provided them with a platform to share their experiences and the importance of their discovery. However, amidst the accolades, there were also skeptics. Some questioned the accuracy of their findings, demanding further proof. Undeterred, Baker and Florence embarked on a speaking tour, their passion and the sheer weight of their evidence eventually silencing their detractors. 
Their story, a testament to human resilience and the pursuit of knowledge, captured the public imagination. Lake Albert became a permanent fixture on maps, forever linked to their intrepid journey. Their expedition not only contributed significantly to geographical knowledge, but also shed light on the diverse cultures and landscapes of a region previously veiled in obscurity. As they settled back in London, a sense of accomplishment and quiet satisfaction filled them. Their adventure, a grueling test of physical and mental fortitude, had redefined their lives. They had ventured into the unknown, faced down danger, and emerged with a discovery that would forever be etched in the annals of exploration. The End